I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw. And he only had three legs. He was a wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw. He only had three legs and one eye. He was a winky wonky donkey. The bird took his eyeball? This is maybe a Halloween kind of story. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye, and he liked to listen to country music. Yee-haw! He was a honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I got a wink. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music and he was quite tall and slim. He was a lanky, honky, tonky, winky, wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music. He was quite tall and slim, and he smelt really, really bad. <sighs> he was a stinky, dinky, lanky, honky, tonky, winky, wonky donkey. The bird has fallen down as he, he's passing gas. That's why he smells so bad. Ah. Oh. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Yee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelt really, really bad. And that morning he'd got up early and hadn't had any coffee. He was a cranky, stinky, dinky, lanky, hunky, tonky, winky, wonky, donkey. I was walking down the road, and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He listened to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelt <coughs> really, really bad. That morning, he'd got up early and hadn't had any coffee. And he was always getting up to mischief. He was a hanky panky cranky stinky dinky lanky honky tonky wonky wink. I messed it up. He was a hanky panky cranky stinky dinky lanky honky tonky winky wonky donkey. He's biting on somebody's underwear hanging on the laundry line. What a crazy donkey. I was walking down the road. And guess what? I saw a donkey. Yee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He listened to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelt <coughs> really, really bad. That morning, he got up early and hadn't had any coffee. He was always getting up to mischief, but he was quite good looking. Naban. <laughs> he was a spunky, hanky, panky, cranky, stinky, dinky, lanky, honky, tonky, winky, wonky, donkey. I got it all right. <laughs> I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. He bit the underwear right off. Did he eat him? And that's the winky, wonky, cranky, stinky, dinky, lanky, wanky, rugly, bugly, biggly, wiggly, floozy, bluesy, biggy, hungy, buggy, borgy, dorgy, wonky, donkey. Poopsie gets lost. Poopsie the cat sat on her cat bed. That's a big house. She licked her paw. She rubbed her ear. She licked her paw again. She made a weird gurgling noise. 
she licked her. Oh, poopsie. This is so boring. Don't you want to do more than just sleep and eat and look fluffy all day? Yeah. There's a whole world out there. Tell me, Poopsie, are you a snoozy house cat or are you a daring adventurer? <coughs> That's what I thought. See that flap in the door over there? <gasps> This may surprise you, but it's called a cat door. All you have to do is push it, and out you'll go. That's it. <laughs> you did it. Good for you. Smell that, Poopsie? That is the sweet, sweet smell of freedom mixed with a little bit of doggy do. Now, I know your humans probably told you never to leave the yard, but that's only because they are party poopers. Fortunately for you, I know where the best fun is. The best fun, that way. Wait, you don't know how to read, do you? Yeah. No? Good, keep going. Danger, enter at your own risk. Unmarked trails. She's going into the jungle. I say, it is rather creepy in here. I hope you don't get eaten by anything. Oh, never mind. You'll be fine. Excitement is just to the right. That way. My right, your left. Oh, poopsie. Look, a lovely vine hanging from a tree. <laughs> you should swing from it like a wild thing. There's the tail of a snake. And these are cobras. And they're very poisonous. And they would probably like to eat a cat. Nom nom. Well, I have to say, that is the best impersonation of a vine I have ever seen. Also, are you all right, Poopsie? You look a bit bushy. Ah, a slightly pungent and murky river. How picturesque. Simply hippity hop across from rock to rock. Go on, it'll be like hopscotch. See these rocks? That rock has eyeballs. Oh, poor Poopsie. Egad, those rocks have eyes and teeth. Talk about masters of disguise. Those rapscallions even fooled me, and I'm smart. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, look, a clump of sleeping pussycats. You should boop one of them on the nose. Boop. <laughs> Don't be shy. How else will they know you want to be BFFs? <laughs> that means best friends forever. They woke up! Oh no! Nope, they are not fans of the boop. Run, Poopsie, run! Like your nine lives depend on it, because they really do! Oh, her bow's coming untied. Whew. Run fast, Poopsie. Quick, into that mysterious cave! Out of the cave! <laughs> There's bats! Oh boy, the tigers are afraid of the bats too. Through those delightful bushes! <laughs> <They're>, they <laughs> ate her! <laughs> They're eating the tigers too. That one got his nose chomped. Over that quaint looking bridge! Oh no, those. There's cracks in the boards. Do you see those cracks? <gasps> oh, it broke! Oh, she fell in! Oh no, a waterfall! <laughs> Oops! Poopsie's having a bad day. Oh, well, Poopsie, this is a fine pickle you've gotten yourself into. I know you wanted adventure, but this is all a bit much, don't you think? She looks like a drowned rat. Oh, don't be such a sourpuss. Look at all the fun we're having. She ties her bow around her head as a headband. Poopsie, she's climbing. What are you doing? You're not going to go home, are you? She climbs to the top, cleans her, her paw. I hope you're not allergic to pollen. Oh, she's using the flowers to make herself orange. Are you trying to look like a tiger or a circus peanut? I'm guessing this is the part where you get eaten, never to be seen again. You should probably turn around. Oh, she has her, she's, she's taming the tigers with her whip. <gasps> So apparently you wrestle crocodiles now? 
feces on that crocodile's back. She tied his mouth shut so he couldn't bite him. Fine, go home if you want to. That's where all the fuddy-duddies are. You should fit right in. She's swinging across. She tied a rock to the other end of it and threw it and it wrapped around and then she swung across and she missed all the cobras. They get no cat to eat today. Poopsie, if you go back through that gate, I will never speak to you again. She's going anyway. Oh well, congratulations, you've made it back to Snoozeville. Don't let the cat door hit you on your backside. I suppose you're going to want to celebrate with a thrilling nap. Actually, a nap doesn't sound that bad. It was exhausting watching you almost get poisoned and eaten by crocodiles and mauled to death by tigers and... Poopsie, I hope you are not thinking about closing this book. Uh-oh. <gasps> Poopsie, I wouldn't do that if I were... <clears throat> well, that was rude. Big Bad Bruce by Bill Peet. Forever Green Forest was a quiet, peaceful place until Bruce, a great shaggy brute of a bear, came wandering up out of a canyon one day. A bear of such size was enough to frighten anyone, and the smaller creatures who lived there kept a sharp eye on Bruce in case he might give them trouble. Look at his big claws. As long as Bruce was busy rooting around under boulders and logs, searching for a feast of beetles and grubs, there was no need to worry. But when the big fellow was feeling frisky and ready for fun, it was time to beware of the bear. What Bruce called fun was to scare the wits out of everyone. The most fun of all for Bruce was rock tumbling. This really is a lot of fun if you've ever got a chance to throw a rock down a hill. Never mind, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Look, it's gonna cause problems. The most fun of all for Bruce was rock tumbling. There were lots of rocks in Forever Green Forest, great jumbles of them. With a swipe of a paw, the bear sent them tumbling down the steep slopes. Three and four at a time, the tumbling rocks shattered logs and flattened the bushes and brush, leaving no place for the rabbits and quail to hide. So they took off in a panic to go leaping and dodging and flying pell-mell in every direction. Look at them, pell-mell. <laughs> That's a word that means just all over the place. And they are all over the place because you got to get away from the rocks. There's more coming. Look out. Once he had them all on the run, Bruce went rolling around on the ground, exploding into great roaring, snorting fits of laughter. Ha ha har, har, ha ha ho, ho, ho. As long as the bear lived in Forever Green Forest, it would never be peaceful and quiet again. And for all anyone could see, he had come there to stay. Then, one afternoon, Bruce made an awful mistake. A terrible blunder. He came across a huge boulder resting on a bluff and decided to give it a ride. Don't do it! Don't do it! Oh, no! It's going to change your life. With a mighty heave, he sent the boulder tumbling down a steep slope. Flumpity, blumpity, wumpity, wump! Smashing pine trees and aspens to splinters and leaving deep dents in the ground as it went. <laughs> there, they just bear... That squirrel's hanging on for dear life. Oh, that owl! He might have something to say about that later. In one last big bounce, it landed kerplump in a berry patch just missing an old woman and her cat by a whisker. Look at that old woman, she's got green skin. It was Roxy, a crafty little witch who was out picking blueberries with her cat, Clinker. That's a pretty good name for a cat, Clinker. Where in blazes did you come from? She shrieked, giving the boulder a vicious kick. How did you get here? Who sent you? Just then, a raucous roar of laughter echoed through the pines. And in a twinkle, Roxy caught sight of the bear on the bluff. So that's who, she cried. And in a fury, she went storming up the slope to face the bear. She's pretty mad. You big lummox, she exploded. A lummox is a dummy. 
You big bumbling brute! That rock could have squashed us to smithereens! And you think it's funny? Har, har, chortled Bruce. Ho, ho, he, har, har. The bear had never seen anything half so funny as the frantic little woman with the wild flying hair. Laugh while you can, warned the witch. But just wait. I'll have the last laugh, Mr. Bear. Oh, indeed I will. Then she took off like a shot to go streaking down the slope so fast her cat could barely keep pace. That's pretty fast. Cats are fast runners. And when the witch reached her cabin at the edge of the forest, she had hatched a plot. <gasps> Uh-oh. I'll make a pie, she decided. A very special pie for old Mr. Bear. In a flicker of an eye, she made the pie crust, and in a trizzle and a trice, she whipped up a filling of blueberries and honey, two of Bear's favorite things to eat. Now for the trickery, she muttered, flipping through her magical cookbook to one of her favorite recipes. Then, reading the directions carefully, Roxy began to measure. One drop of dwindling, two blurps of belittling, a smidgen of minikin, a half teaspoon of twerp, a shrift of shortening, and then one pinch of kaput should do it. The instant the pie was baked, a golden brown and ready to serve, Roxy scurried out the door with it, back to the forest. Then, keeping an eye out for the bear, she crept along through the shadows, as slinky as a fox. And there goes Clinker, slinking along with her. You gotta be really quiet to sneak up on a bear. They got big teeth and sharp claws. When she reached a small clearing near the spot where she had met the bear, there was not a sign of him. But she could hear him snorting and snooting around in the brush somewhere up the slope. When a bear snorts and snoots, they sound like this. <laughs> That's how they snort and snoot for food. Quickly, she picked out a pine stump, jerked off her apron, and flung it over the top, then put the pie on it. The table's all set, she whispered. Now skit scat kitty cat, let's get lost. And they ducked down behind a log just a hop, skip, and a jump from the stump to wait for old Mr. Bear. Look at that lovely blueberry and honey scent wafting up the hill straight toward our friend, Big Bad Bruce. They didn't wait long. Pretty soon, a whiffle of breeze sent the sweet aroma of blueberries and honey drifting up to Bruce, and he followed his snuffling nose straight to the stump. <laughs> mm! <laughs> Snatched up the pie in his paws, and in one chomp and a slurp, it was gone. Here he is licking the plate. Ho, ho! crackled Roxy, popping up from behind the log. I tricked you, Mr. Bear! Ho, ho, did I ever! Bruce didn't like being surprised, and he let go with an angry, Wolf! Grolf yourself, Roxy shot back. You don't scare me! Just watch out you don't get pecked to bits by a quail, or stomped on by a, hmm, rabbit! Snurf, snorted the grumpy bear, and he wheeled around and lumbered off into the underbrush. Bruce hadn't gone very far when he began feeling drowsy. That means he was tired. So drowsy he could barely keep his eyes open. So he flopped down against a tree trunk to rest. And in the time it takes for one big yawn, <gasps> While the bear slept, he gradually began to grow smaller. Inch by inch and little by little, Bruce dwindled away. He kept shrinking and shriveling until he was down to the size of a possum. And still he kept shrinking. When the diminished spell was finally finished, 
the bear had dwindled all the way down to the size of a chipmunk. Oh, no. That's dangerous to be that little. Bruce was awakened by a sharp peck on the head, and with an angry growl that came out like a squeak, he reared up all ready to fight. But when he found himself nose to beak with a giant of a quail, Bruce backed off to gape in amazement. Then as the bewildered bear looked around, he was surprised by three more giant quail and a pair of huge rabbits. <gasps> oh no! The rabbits and quail had recognized Bruce, and as they closed in to attack, he quickly turned tail and went plowing headlong into a tangle of brambles. But there was no chance of outrunning the rabbits and quail in a thicket. They were close on his... A thicket is where the rabbits and quail love to hide, and so it's their home turf. They know how to get around in there. They were close on his heels, pecking and stomping the bear with a fury. Bruce didn't dare to fight back. He kept dugging and dodging his way through the brambles, frantically searching for some place to hide, a gopher hole, a flat rock to squeeze under, any place at all. Oh, they're after him. They're going to try and get him. At last, he stumbled into a forest of cattails at the edge of a creek, and in a flying leap, oh, sploosh, he flung himself into the water. Kersploosh and bobbed up well beyond the reach of the rabbits and quail. Then, kicking and thrashing with all four feet, Bruce headed for the opposite bank, which was a long swim for him, a tiny bear. About halfway across, a sudden swirl of current sent him spinning around and around, upside down and under. He's in a whirlpool. Bruce was about to be swept down the twisting creek and away forever when he grabbed onto a rock and managed to haul himself out of the water. Then the bruised and bedraggled bear sprawled out on his belly, choking and wheezing, snorting out bubbles until at last he was able to breathe. For a long time he lay there staring into the swirling stream, trying to figure out what could have happened to make him so small. He wondered if it might have been something he ate. Suddenly, he remembered the blueberry pie and the fierce little woman who had warned him. Just watch out, you don't get pecked to bits by a quail or stomped on by a hmm, rabbit. All at once, Bruce realized he had been tricked by a crafty old witch, shrunk by a magic spell. By the time the sun had gone down and Deep shadows had crept across the creek. A chilly breeze rippled the dark water, and the soggy, wet bear shivered and shook from the cold and also from fright. Bruce knew that the night hunters were already out on the prowl, and now he was fair game. The jittery bear sat up on his haunches, looking all about in the dark for any sign of danger. He looked everywhere but up or he would have seen the frowsy old owl peering down from a tree limb above. The fuzzy little brown thing on the rock was a choice tidbit for the owl, and he was just about to swoop down when all of a sudden, a screechy voice split the air. Mr. Bear! Mr. Bear! With a terrified hoot, hoot! The owl sailed off into the night, leaving the bear to face another kind of danger. Oh no, Clinker's going to grab him. In desperation, Bruce scrunched himself up into a tiny ball, hoping the witch would mistake him for part of the rock. But there was no chance of fooling foxy old Roxy. And holding her lantern out over the creek, she spotted the bear in a flash. Ho, ho, she cackled. There you are, Mr. Bear. No bigger than a minute. Quick, quick, Clinker, go fetch him. Skit, scat. Before the bear could blink an eye, the cat snatched him off the rock by the scruff of the neck and leaped lightly back to the bank. Good cat, cried Roxy. Now home we go. But easy does it. This little bear has had a big day. As Bruce was carried along through the dark forest, he didn't dare put up a struggle. Besides, he was too weary to even lift a paw and much too scared. He was sure the crafty old witch planned to fix him for good. If she could shrink him down to a runt of a thing, she could turn him into a tadpole or into a flea or make him disappear altogether. But to the bear's surprise, 
the witch turned out to be a kindly old woman, and as gentle as could be, just as long as she kept her temper. Roxy loved flowers, see, and birds and animals, especially small animals, and she soon grew very fond of the tiny bear, so she decided to keep him that way. Wouldn't you love to have a bear like that? Clinker the cat also took a liking to the bear, and they ate out of the very same bowl and slept in the same corner together under the kitchen stove. That's a warm place to sleep. Little bears have short memories, and in a few days Bruce forgot all about ever being a giant of a bear. For all he knew, Roxy's flower garden was a beautiful leafy green forest with plenty of room to roam. Whenever the tiny bear was feeling frisky and ready for fun, he flipped pebbles around as if they were boulders, just to scare the wits out of the grasshoppers, the beetles, and caterpillars. From a bug's eye view, Bruce was a great, big, hairy, scary, horrible brute of a beast. One wonderful day, Jim Panzee woke to discover that nothing was right. The sun was too bright, the sky was too blue, and the bananas were too sweet. I don't know if bananas are ever too sweet. Not around here, anyway. They're never ripe. Jim was confused. What's going on? Maybe you're grumpy, suggested Norman from next door. I'm not grumpy, Jim insisted. On his walk, he met Marabou. Jim's grumpy, Norman told Marabou. Why are you grumpy, Jim? asked Marabou. It's such a wonderful day. Grumpy? Me? I'm not grumpy, said Jim. But look at how you're standing, Marabou said. It's true, said Norman. You're all hunched. So Jim loosened up. <laughs> Then he ran into Lemur. Jim's grumpy, Norman told Lemur. Why are you grumpy, Jim? asked Lemur. It's such a wonderful day. Grumpy? Me? I'm not grumpy, said Jim. Your eyebrows look grumpy, said Lemur. It's true, said Norman. They're all bunched up. So Jim raised his, uh, his brow. <laughs> Can you do that with your eyebrows? <laughs> Then he tripped over Snake. Oh no, said Norman. That's the last thing you need when, you f when you're feeling so grumpy. Grumpy? Me? I'm not grumpy, said Jim. Then why that frown, said Snake. I think it's because he tripped over you, Norman whispered to Snake. So Jim put on a smile. That's not a real smile. He just doesn't want to get eaten. Finally, Jim looked happy. Boing, boing, boing. But he didn't feel happy inside. Everyone wanted Jim to enjoy his wonderful day. You should sing with us, said the birds. La, 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 la. Jim didn't feel like singing. <laughs> you should swing with us, said the monkeys. Jim didn't feel like swinging. You should roll with us, said the zebras. But Jim didn't feel like rolling. You should stroll with us, said the peacocks. Jim didn't feel like strolling. You should <sighs> lie in the grass, said the lion. You should stomp your feet. <laughs> Gonna rattle in him to death. Look, he's about to fall over. You should take a bath and make a splash. That's an otter. I love otters. You should hug someone. <laughs> the snake is giving a rabbit a hug. <laughs> you should laugh. You should take a nap, says the crocodile. You should eat old meat, said Marabou. Ooh, that's a dead carcass of something. Or some honey, said a bear. You should jump up and down. You should sit in the sun. <laughs> yeah. 
but they just stare. You should dance, said the porcupine, dancing away. But Jim didn't feel like doing any of that. Why are you grumpy, Jim? asked the others. It's such a wonderful day. I'm not grumpy! shouted Jim as he beat his chest. I'd do it, but the microphone would just... You, you see, it doesn't sound very good. And he stomped off. <laughs> He's not happy. Jim felt sorry. A little sorry for shouting at everyone, but mostly sorry for himself. I guess I am grumpy, Jim sighed. Hmm. And just as he was starting to feel really sad, hey, there's a turtle. Do you like turtles? I like turtles. You're looking good, Jonathan. Just got an awesome face paint job. What do you think? I like turtles. All right, you're a great zombie. He came upon Norman. Norman was slumped. His eyebrows were bunched up, and he was frowning. What's the matter? Are you grumpy? asked Jim. No. I danced with a porcupine, said Norman. <laughs> There's a bird right there. Are you okay? asked Jim. It hurts, but I'll probably feel better soon enough, said Norman. Are you still grumpy? Yeah, said Jim. But I'll probably feel better soon enough, too. For now, I need to be grumpy. It's a wonderful day to be grumpy, said Norman. Jim agreed. <laughs> He's got band-aids all over his bottom. He sat on a porcupine. And he already felt a little bit better. The end. Florinda the cow took the sun now and then in the back of a friend's house, the farmhand named Len. When a swallow swooped by, though she leaped up to follow, she raced past the barn, out the gate, down a hollow. Oh, to fly, what delight, what a treat, what a thrill, she cried as she reached the tip top of a hill. Goodbye, graceful swallow, how sweetly you soar. I've never, not once in my life, soared before. But I want to be free, like you birds in that sky. And I promise you now that I will learn to fly. Clorinda ran straight to her friend, the pig, Hop. She said, I must fly. But the pig told her, stop. We all want to fly. It's a dream we all share. But please, my good friend, a cow in the air? You haven't got feathers, Clorinda, nor wings, and to fly, I assure you, requires such things. Clorinda's eyes brightened. She said, please explain why a cow isn't able to fly her own plane. What plane? asked the pig. He was clearly not thrilled, but the cow very cheerfully said, one will build. She danced to her truck with her face all aglow. So happy the pig couldn't bear to say no. I knew I could count on you, Hop, said the cow. And Lenny will help us. I'm sure he'll know how to cope with a problem if one should arise like you, my good friend. Lenny's kind and he's wise. They drove to the dump and found boxes and cases that they thought they could use for the struts and the braces. The wheels that they needed, they couldn't find cheap. So they borrowed a pair off Lenny's old Jeep. How nice of him. To cover the wings and the long fuselage, that's, that's the middle part of the plane that you actually sit in. It's called a fuselage. I think that's a French word. Uh, not that the French invented planes, but the first plane the Wright brothers made didn't have a fuselage, so maybe they invented fuselages. Anyway, to cover the wings and the long fuselage, they stripped the tin roof off of Lenny's garage. The motor they got from Len's washing machine after first making sure all his laundry was clean. And finally, the friends, with some turns on a screw, got the prop fastened on. And with that, they were through. Len, Hop, and the cow made a very good team. The guys kept her working, and she helped them dream. Time for the test flight. Let's put on our goggles, Clorinda declared as Hop wiggled the toggles. Toggles are switches. Clorinda declared as Hop wiggled the toggles. Len cranked the engine. It gave a loud cough. 
They roared through the garden and then they took off. Oh, look at the pumpkins. Hooray, cried the cow as they flew through the skies. Her co-pilot whimpered and covered his eyes. For the wings had come loose and so had the rudder. The plane gave a wheeze and it started to shudder. Downward they plunged, but by some lucky stroke, the plane came to rest at the top of an oak. Poor Hop, he was gasping and clutching his heart. Clorinda, he said, I believe from the start your dream was delightful but slightly unsound, and that creatures like us ought to stay on the ground. Clorinda said sadly, I guess that is true. Flight is a thing that a cow cannot do. Here comes Len with his ladder. And yet, observed Len, as he helped them descend, your plane did take off, so I'd say as your friend, your goal was achieved. You guys did it. You flew. Well, murmured Hop, I suppose that is true. Clorinda cried, bravo, hip hop, hooray. With the pig's help and lens, she was well on her way to planning the next flight and then several more. What helpers, she said, this is what friends are for. They constructed a rocket. The rocket went, but that didn't matter. The friends wouldn't quit. A copter, they cried. They all worked nonstop. It went up with a roar and came down with a plop. Oh, Len's boat with a washing machine on it didn't work very well. Then over the barn rose a glorious moon. It was round, it was full, it was like a balloon. A balloon, the cow shouted. That's perfect, oh wow! Yes, cried the pig, let's get started right now. There on the wash line are clothes of all sorts. We can make our balloon out of socks, sheets, and shorts. A balloon, observed Len. As you may be aware, in order to rise, we'll need lots of hot air. With glasses and mirrors, the air could be heated. They worked until dawn when the job was completed. The magnified light Len supplied did the trick. The balloon filled with air, and Clorinda said, Quick! Into the basket! She clambered aboard. Hop squeezed in behind her, and upward they soared! Where's, Where's Len? Len? They both said as they rose in the sky. Len was still on the ground. He was waving goodbye, for in all their haste about what they would do, They'd forgotten to wait until he climbed in, too. Oh. Through cloud banks and rainbows, past ravens and cranes, they flew over mountains and rivers and plains. Their hearts swelled with joy in the wide, immense sky. Oh, hop, Clarinda sighed. That's lovely to fly. Look at those birds. Wow. New York and the ocean both sped by, and they heard the rich chimes of the famous Big Ben, the Big Ben of England, in the crowds down below. People yelled, splendid and jolly good show. They heard drums, fifes, and trumpets, and bagpiping men. Clorinda said sadly, we should have brought Len. This concert is something he'd love to attend. It's great fun for us, but I do miss our friend. As for Len, in his dreams, he had never foreseen that his friends would appear on the news with the Queen. The Queen told them, Bravo! Never before have a cow and a pig ballooned to our shore. So kneel, noble heroes, while we with our sword grant you both knighthood. Now name your reward. The cow thought and thought, and the pig scratched his head. They whispered a moment. Then both of them said, Our helper was Len, and how happy he'd be if we could bring back to him some of your tea. How kind, said the queen, that you've thought of your friend. As for me, I must say I'm delighted to send through you to this Lenny the very same tea he'd get if he came for a chit-chat with me. <laughs> With that, they said thanks for the lengthening shade, warned both of the friends that the day would soon fade. Her Majesty's staff helped them load and untie, and cheered as they watched the balloon climb the sky. Yay! We love you! Ha -ha! Heading west, ever west, over seas laced with foam, 
they caught sight at last of their own farmland home. Hi, you guys. Welcome back. There, Len, with a welcoming cheer, lent a hand and helped them touch down on the best place to land. They gave Len a hug, then the cow with a grin presented the tea in its decorative tin. And they promised their friend that the next time they flew, they'd take him along so he'd meet the queen too. And under the stars, in the moon's silver beams, they talked of adventures, of friendship, and dreams. The End In a wonderful place where the day was just dawning and the breezes blew soft on a warm golden morning, in a place where the creatures ran wild and played free, a koala called Kevin clung to a tree. This is Kevin, the koala. Look down here, you can see the kangaroos and this is called a billabong. This is where the water comes down and the animals go and drink the water. And we've got a little wombat down there with a hat on his head. A nicer gray fella you never would meet, as soft as a soft thing, from ear tufts to feet. His favorite way to relax in the sun was to cling and to nap and to munch a leaf bun. And after all this, well, he'd need a nice rest. Shoo! Yes, Kevin liked sticking to what he knew best. What a wonderful life. Climbing and living in a tree and eating the leaves. Mmm. You see, high up was safe since he liked a slow pace, while the ground down below seemed a frightening place. Too fast and too loud, too big and too strange. Nope. Kevin preferred not to move or to change. Here we've got some big reds. These are the red roos and these are the regular kangaroos. This is a cassowary bird, and the cassowary is the most dangerous bird on earth. It's, it's basically a dinosaur. And this is a kangaroo rat, a wombat with a hat, and some dingoes. So he clung to his tree as he knew what to do, and was never too keen to try anything new. So when wombat stopped by and shouted one day, Hi hey Kevin! Why don't you come down here and play? Um, I think, he replied, I should stay in my plant. I'm busy right now. No, I'm sorry, I can't. Kevin's Leaf Collection, spelled with a K like koala. Why not, cried the ruse with a super loud cheer. Yes, why, called the dingoes. There's nothing to fear. It might be from dingoes, I don't know, they might bite. But Kevin, who'd never been one to act fast, said, I've clinging to do, but it's nice that you've asked. As Kevin sat watching them chatter and share, a part of him wished he could join in down there. Here they are having a wonderful kumbaya moment down around the fire. There's a didgeridoo. You blow into one end and make a... <laughs> Kind of sound, but there he is in his hammock, swinging. But he knew he'd miss home, it was so dark and so late. The whole thing was risky, adventure could wait. Look at that croc. Whatever the invite, he'd always say no. Oh dear, it seemed Kevin just couldn't let go. So his life was the same, no matter the day. The weeks came and went and the months rolled away. And Kevin stayed still while the world moved around until he awoke to a worrying sound. Tap, tap, the sound went. Well, this was a blow. Tap, tapity, tap, 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 oh no. That would be a woodpecker. Uncling, the crowd called, which had gathered below. Leap and we'll catch you, just let yourself go. There he is, clinging on for dear life. It's starting to crack. 
And there they all are. They're ready to catch him with this bit of green netting. But Kevin was scared. Let go. No, I shan't. I won't, shouted Kevin. Oh, dear. I just... It's starting to fall. Starting. Can't! Whoomph! Down came the tree, and with it was bringing crash and a wallop, a Kevin still clinging. There he goes, his little cuckoo clock is about to hit the ground. Maps of Australia, uh, the lion inside, the leaf book, and his hat, of course. Down comes the tree. This is the scariest bit. Kevin, he carefully opened one eye. And looked up at the love staring down from the sky. Then one paw by one paw, he loosened his hold. He felt springy and light and happy and bold. The worst he could think of had now come to pass. And he was just fine. Why, he felt quite first class. So when Wombat leaned over and held his paw out, Kevin no longer felt worry or doubt. He's got confidence now. When Dingo asked, Now will you come out to play? The crowd all joined in with a, What do you say? And even though this wasn't part of his plan, Kevin replied, Yes, I think that I can. And Kevin from then on was always can do. There he goes, jumping. He's going to get wet if he falls in, but he's not worried. He's just going to jump and do what they're doing, and he's going to make it. And those little fish, they've never seen a koala on the ground before. Because life can be great when you try something new. The cleverest thought popped into his head. He leaped up in the darkness and held up a paw. I've got it, he said. What I need is a roar. Roar! I mean, what if this mouse with the weeniest squeak were a little more gutter and a little less meek? He'd be frightening. Well, he'd still be the smallest of fuzzy brown mice, but he'd make friends and join in, and life would be nice. See, all the other animals would respect respect him. Yes, thought the mouse, I must find out how. I will learn how to roar, and I will learn it now. How to Roar by A. A. Mouse. He has to stand on top of his own pots and pans to reach the top shelf. But it wouldn't be easy. There was only one beast who could teach him this thing, but might make him a feast. How to roar. He's going to have to go and ask Lion, but Lion may eat him. It was time to be strong, take a chance. After all, forever was such a long time to feel small. When you wish upon a moon, and there's the bright morning sun. So he made himself brave and he thought like a winner. He set off for the top, hoping not to be dinner. Look, there's bugs at the bottom. There's a praying mantis. Those are actually quite frightening. And this is a large beetle as big as him. It felt like the scariest thing he could do. But if you want things to change, you first have to change you. That is incredibly true. The farther he climbed, the closer he got to the slumbering lion reclining on top. See him? He's way up there. After all of these bones. What a dangerous climb. Then at last, as he stood on his tippity toes, he found himself suddenly nose to nose. Ahem. Pardon, pardon me. Wake up, Mr. Lion. You've got company. Um, squeak, Mr. Lion. What I've come to you for is squeak. Do you think you could teach me your roar? He's right there, nose to nose. A silence befell that twinkling plain. 
Lion opened his eyes and puffed out his mane. <laughs> Time went so slowly it felt like a week. Then he opened his mouth and let out an... <laughs> He's jumped off the ground. The lion curled up in a terrified ball. He didn't like this, not one bit at all. Don't hurt me, he whimpered. Oh, try to be nice. Well, this mighty great lion was frightened of mice. Don't worry, Mouse Peep. I'm here as a friend. Let's hang out together. Be pals to the end. That was a magical moment for sure. When the mouse didn't feel at all small anymore, he had found his true voice and learned to speak out. And for that, you don't need to roar or to shout. He can whisper in Lion's ear. And from that day and always, the two were a pair. They both liked that rock better. Now that rock was to share. The mouse, while still little, felt big in his head. And Lion, he still roared but with laughter instead. <laughs> yes, that day they both learned that no matter your size, we all have a mouse and a lion inside. Encore for Eleanor. It says, Tingle Hoffer's Big Top Circus. Acrobats, lions, tigers, clowns, and action. Coming September 9th. Three Ring Circus. Eleanor the Elephant was a great circus star, and the one and only elephant ever to perform on a tall pair of stilts. The huge seven-ton pachyderm put on such a spectacular act that she always left the crowd calling for more. Encore! Encore! Everyone shouted. Come on, Eleanor! One more! One more! But great circus stars can't keep going forever, no matter how clever they are. And after performing her act for over 40 years, the old elephant was getting weak in the knees and was fearful of falling. Then one summer night, while she was high up in her stilts, Eleanor suddenly lost her balance. Down she tumbled to hit the sawdust floor in one colossal, earth-shaking kerwump! And as she lay there sprawled out in a heap, a sudden hush fell over the crowd. Everyone thought surely the old elephant was done for, that she had broken every last bone. <clears throat> but as it turned out, her worst injury was a slightly sprained ankle, and when she finally hauled herself onto her feet and went limping out of the big top, the crowd gave her a standing ovation. Always before the cheering of the crowd had been sweet music to Eleanor's big flappy ears, but nothing could make her happy on this night. She was much too worried about what Colonel T.J. Tinglehofer, the circus boss, was thinking. Old TJ expected everyone in his show to put on a top-notch performance without so much as one little slip, so Eleanor was pretty sure that her dreadful crash landing was the very last act of her circus career. Sure enough, TJ decided that Eleanor was no longer fit to stay in the show. She's too much of a risk, he said. The next time she falls, the old girl might flatten a clown or squash the ringmaster. She's gotta go! So the very next day, a seven-ton truck came to the circus grounds to haul Eleanor away. As she was about to leave, a few old friends were there to express their regrets and wish her the best wherever she went, and the unhappy elephant bade them farewell with a half-hearted wave of her trunk. The next thing she knew, Eleanor was caught up in a great rush of traffic jolting along through a big city past dreary factory buildings. Since no one had told her where she was going, the elephant could only guess and all sorts of grisly ideas popped into her head. She wondered if she might be heading for a glue factory. Then she wondered if they have, if they ever made elephant skin shoes or elephant leather jackets. And still worse, she wondered if she might be ground up into seven tons of fertilizer. Eleanor was quaking with fright from her trunk to her toes when the truck finally slowed down to enter a tall gateway. 
It was the gateway to the city zoo, which was the only place Colonel Tinglehofer could think of where a worn-out old circus elephant could live happily ever after. She was put into a pen with plenty of hay and a full water trough, and her elephant house was a neat red barn shaded by a sycamore tree. I'm lucky to be here, said Eleanor, after taking a look around, and yet I'll never be happy unless I can perform a few tricks or do something clever to earn my keep. When people stopped at her pen to stare at her, Eleanor felt silly just standing there with nothing to do but stare back at them. And without her fancy circus robe and feathery headdress, she felt like an overgrown, wrinkled, ugly, big bloop of a thing. If I can't look my best, she grumbled, then I don't want to be seen at all. So she stayed out of sight as best she could by hiding in her barn all through the day until the zoo was closed. Then, when she was sure no one was around to watch, Eleanor came out for her evening meal of alfalfa, cabbage, broccoli, lettuce, and carrots. It was a lonely, miserable life for an elephant who loved cheering crowds, bright lights, and lots of excitement. And she would have gone on being miserable if someone hadn't happened along to change her dreary routine. That someone was a teenage girl who came to the zoo to sketch the animals. She made such a rack at setting up her easel on the sidewalk that she awakened Eleanor from her afternoon nap. And being ever so curious, the elephant leaned out of her barn door to see what the noise was about. She was even more curious when she discovered the girl just outside the fence getting ready to make a drawing. Eleanor had often wondered how people drew pictures, and this was her first chance to find out. Eleanor hoped the girl wouldn't mind if she watched for a minute or two. Just the same, she was taking no chances, so without making a sound, she crept across her pen to the fence where she peeked over the girl's shoulder. One glance was enough for Eleanor to see the girl was drawing the rhino who lived in the pen just across the way. With a few quick strokes of her charcoal, she had outlined the sleepy half-open eye, the stumpy horn, the wrinkly snout, and the underslung jaw and to the elephant's delight, she even put the tufts of hair on the tips of the ears. <clears throat> the girl was determined to make her drawing as lifelike as possible, right down to the smallest detail. So every now and then she stopped to study the rhino and figure out where to put all the creases and folds in his leathery side. She was in a hurry to get finished before the drowsy old fellow roused himself out of his stupor and changed position. But by the time the girl was ready to sketch the hind legs and the last half of the rhino, he felt an itch coming on. All at once, he flopped on the ground and began rolling over and over on his back, snorting furiously and kicking up his heels. Oh, phooey, exclaimed the girl. Now wouldn't you know it? Why couldn't that big oaf stay put for one more measly minute? The inconsiderate clod! With an angry shrug, she tossed her charcoal onto the sidewalk, then crumpled up her drawing and flung it into a trash can. Then she wandered away to a shady knoll overlooking a lily pond to watch the ducks and swans. She needed a peaceful moment. The elephant was disappointed too, and she was about to head back to her barn when she discovered that the charcoal was within easy reach, and the sketch pad and easel were less than a trunk length away. Suddenly the elephant was inspired to draw a picture, and after a sneaky sidelong glance at the girl to make sure she was still watching the ducks and swans, Eleanor seized the charcoal in her trunk. Without a second to lose, the elephant drew the very first thing that came to mind, the familiar face of Zonko the clown she remembered from the circus. To start off, she made two crisscrosses for eyes, scrawled a couple of silly eyebrows and a long pointed nose, then a crooked toothy grin. The drawing was far better than Eleanor expected, and she was smiling to herself as she drew the big ears, scribbled some hair, and put a tall hat on his head. The elephant was nearly finished with her picture and was putting a few ruffles on the floppy clown collar when suddenly she was caught by surprise. Wowie! cried the girl, pulling the drawing off the sketch pad. I can't believe it! You wonderful big beastie! You are really terrific! Just fabulous! Too much! Then waving the clown drawing in the air, the girl shouted at the top of her voice, Come look! Come look, everyone! Come see what the elephant drew! Come look! In no time at all, she was surrounded by a swarm of school kids and their teacher, along with Mr. McJunkins, the zoo director who knew everything there was to know about animals. The kids and their teacher loved the idea that the elephant had drawn a picture, and they were bubbling with excitement until Mr. McJunkins stepped in to squelch them all. 
I hate to spoil your fun, but I'm afraid it is altogether impossible for an elephant to draw a picture. Even though Eleanor was once a clever circus performer, and she is, after all, nothing more than a dumb animal. No one likes to be called dumb, especially a super intelligent elephant like Eleanor. And she was furious. A dumb animal, am I? She grumbled into her trunk. I'll show that uppity fellow a thing or two. Oh, indeed I will. Once again, Eleanor gripped the charcoal in her trunk, and as everyone watched in amazement, the riled-up elephant dashed off a portrait of a lion. It was old Maynard, another familiar face from the circus. Scraggly mane, mournful eyes, whiskers and all. And she finished the sketch in only 17 seconds. St 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 stupendous stammered Mr. McJunkins. Fa fantastic Eleanor is a super sensational elephant. If she can draw a clown and a lion, she can draw lots of things. What do you say we put on an elephant drawing show? Terrific idea, everyone happily agreed, and of course Eleanor was overjoyed at the chance to be a star performer once more. In less than a week, a special stage was built for the show, and an extra-large easel was set up to hold extra-large sketch pads so that Eleanor could make large drawings for hundreds of schoolchildren to see. And best of all, Eleanor was outfitted in a fancy new robe so she could look her loveliest while she was performing her act. Eleanor's drawings could never be considered great art, yet as far as anyone knew, they were the best drawings ever made by an elephant. But for all the kids could see, they were plenty good and even super terrific. And at the end of each performance, the children were always calling for more. Encore, Eleanor! Encore! They shouted. One more, Eleanor! Please! Draw one more! Which was sweet music to the happy old elephant's big flappy ears. The end. Hansel and Gretel. Ninja chicks! Once upon a time, no, once upon a menacing time, two chicks knew a fox was at large. That means out on the run, not arrested and in jail. Their ma had been taken and pop was quite shaken, so Hansel and Gretel took charge. Says Three Pigs Dojo, get empowered, not devoured. They trained in the art of ninjutsu and practiced their wing throws and blocks. They learned how to creep without making a peep so they wouldn't fall prey to that fox. One day they returned from the dojo to a coop in complete disarray. The signs of a tussle showed someone with muscle had dragged their dear papa away. They quickly surveyed their surroundings. The fox had left prints in the dirt. Come on, we're not chicken. That fox needs a lickin' before our poor papa gets hurt. They trekked till they spotted a feather. It looks like we're on the right track. They kept up the chase, dropping crumbs just in case, so they'd easily find their way back. The forest grew twisted and tangled as Hansel and Gretel searched on. The light faded fast, and they noticed at last that the trail and the breadcrumbs <gasps> were gone. Oh no! They shuddered and groped in the darkness. We're lost, whispered Hansel with dread. They weaved and they wound and kept roaming around until they saw light up ahead. It came from a cottage of cornbread. Let's eat, Hansel clucked with delight. Because they're chickens and chickens like corn, and so cornbread. That's amazing. She nibbled away till she heard someone say, my dear, come on in for a bite. I'll whip up some quick teriyaki while we wait for the tea cakes to bake. Why not, Hansel reckoned, off guard for a second. Then quickly she saw her mistake. She gasped and then dashed to the corner, where Pop was confined in a crate. Watch out, Pop cried. You'll be chicken pop pied. She sidestepped, but it was too late. <gasps> The fox plucked her up in a hurry and shoved her right into the pen. You're scrawny and tough, but you'll plump soon enough. For now, I'll just stir-fry this hen. The fluttering then looked familiar. It's Mama, cried Hensel in shock. Hensel was scared, but she came well prepared. I bet I can jimmy this lock. That means to open it. 
Outside in the dark, Greta listened, dismayed at the fox's misdeed. She climbed to the flue and squeezed her way through the chimney. The ninja-like silence and speed. Then Gretel swooped in and snatched Mama and swiftly adjusted her stance. The fox took a leap, but with one feathered sweep, the chick boldly blocked her advance. Not bad, said the fox, striding toward them. Give up, Gretel clucked, undeterred. The fox said, surrender? No way, chicken tender. Your cheap little threats are absurd. The fox charged and grappled with Gretel. A flurry of feathers and fur. The fox held her tight, but Gretel wrenched right as something zipped past with a burr. There goes the walk. With the fox in a daze, Gretel vaulted as Hansel and Papa broke free. With one wicked spin, Hansel kicked the fox in. You're done with your chick-frying spree. She slammed the door shut and locked it. The fox crumpled, looking unnerved. You two ninja chicks got us out of that fix, and justice, not dinner, was served. From then on, they made it their mission to rescue, protect, and defend. They'd work night and day to liberate prey till bird napping came to an end. In Monterey Bay, there's a jumble of rock stacked up like a castle across from the dock. The king of this castle, an old crab called Kermit, lived all by himself in a cave like a hermit. There was never a crab who was one half as selfish or one tenth as mean as this crusty old shellfish. What made Kermit greedy and grumpy that way was the shortage of food everywhere in the bay. For a crab must depend on what he can find, small scraps and tidbits of any old kind. To Kermit, each day meant a fight for survival, with every last seagull and crab as a rival. They're stealing his food, they're taking it away! Unless it is cured, sometimes greediness grows. Where it finally stops, alas, nobody knows. And before very long, Kermit grabbed everything, from a rusty padlock to a ball of kite string, a broken jackknife, a pair of old shoes, things that a crab couldn't possibly use. He's in a tug-of-war with the other crabs. Look at that, he has a harmonica. And his cave was soon crammed without one inch to spare. There was just enough space left for Kermit in there. Like any old miser, he wanted a lot of something or other. He didn't care what. And he'd have been greedy the rest of his days if an odd twist of fate hadn't changed Kermit's ways. This remarkable change in old Kermit began with an everyday thing, just a battered tin can. A pork and bean can that had been tossed away, far out in the sand dunes that bordered the bay. The crumpled tin lid caught the sun's bright reflection which caused it to sparkle in every direction. And since the old miser had never been told that bright things that glitter are not always gold, he supposed that it must be some valuable thing that someone had lost, a gold watch or a ring. So he crawled off the rocks and out onto the land, then over the hilly broad stretches of sand. And not until Kermit was next to his prize did he realize a trick had been played on his eyes. Why, you phony tin faker, you, growled the old grump. Rubble like you should be tossed in a dump. Then just as he turned to start back for the bay, the crab spied a dog who was heading his way. Uh-oh. Dogs are trouble for a small crab. The dog was exploring and trying out smells, sniffing at driftwood and empty clamshells. One sniff at the tin can told him what had been in it, so he turned to sniff at old Kermit a minute. In one grab, the crab gave the dog a sharp nip on his sensitive nose, and he let out a yip. That'll teach you, he snapped, to go sniffing at me. Then he turned himself around to head back for the sea. But the dog made a leap, seized the crab in his jaws by the back of the shell beyond reach of the claws. 
Put me down, cried the crab. Put me down, you big brute, or I'll give you another good pinch on the snoot. But the dog paid no heed to old Kermit's command. He set to work digging a hole in the sand. The crab guessed at once it was not just a cave. It was going straight down, so it must be a grave. What a horrible end, Kermit said with a groan, to be buried alive like a worthless old bone. That is a mad dog. Then just as the dog dropped the crab in the hole, a boy happened by with a long fishing pole. You old hound, he scolded, what a mean thing to do. Now how would you like it if I buried you? You're too nice a dog to do something like that. Then he scooped up the crab in his tattered straw hat, trotted off down the beach to the edge of the sea, and flipping his hat, he set old Kermit free. Sploosh. With a sigh of relief, the old crab went his way, on back to his castle of rocks in the bay. If it weren't for the boy, he just had to admit, there'd be no tomorrow, that would have been it. I'll reward my young friend, said old Kermit, that's what, with all my life savings, every last thing I've got. But things like old shoes or a broken jackknife could never repay him for saving my life. The ideal reward would be a new bike. There's something I'm sure that a small boy would like. Yet how could a crab ever buy a bicycle without any money, not even a nickel? He pondered the problem that whole afternoon, then far into the night by the light of the moon. But try as he might, alas and alack, he thought of no way he could pay the boy back. Hmm. The next afternoon, as he crawled on the rocks, Kermit spotted the boy on the end of the docks. The very same boy, the old crab could tell that, by the faded striped shirt and the tattered straw hat. He had been lulled to sleep by the warm summer breeze, with his fishing pole propped on his patched trouser knees. I might help him to catch a big fish, Kermit thought, if there's any big fish around here to be caught. Of course, he must first find the boy's baited hook, so he scrambled out into the bay for a look. And just a few yards from the pilings he found it, with a school of small minnows all swarming around it. That's the worst thing when you're fishing. Tons of little minnows biting at your bait. Kermit tiptoed along, gently dragging the bait. If he happened to give it the least little jerk, the boy would reel in and his plans wouldn't work. Get that worm away from those little fish. He wants a big one. <gasps> so... Kermit kept on till he came to a ledge where he stopped to peer cautiously over the edge. He's got to be careful, there's big fish out there. Then reaching as far as he could with his claws, he lowered the bait toward a halibut's jaws. <laughs> the big fish took a look, and in one mighty scoop, both the worm and the hook disappeared in one gloop. <coughs> the halibut eats the worm. Uh-oh. When he found he'd been hooked, he took off like a streak, and the line, which was really too flimsy and weak, suddenly snapped from the force of the shock. Somewhere behind Kermit back near the dock, he was on his own now with no one to help, and off he went flying through tangles of kelp. Up over the waves, he went floppity flip, straight out of the bay on a wild foamy trip. Then somewhere far out in the broad rolling sea, the furious fish finally fought his way free. This is why you gotta be careful fishing for big halibut. Way out in the deep water, the crab couldn't crawl. About all he could do was to let himself fall. And Kermit went tumbling down in slow motion into the dark gloomy depths of the ocean to the soft sandy floor where he lit with a plunk near the place where an old pirate ship had been sunk. The huge hull had been smashed, all the sails ripped and tattered, and in every direction the cargo was scattered. Wow. I wonder how long it's been there. <gasps> A shark! I imagine, said Kermit, I'm not safe down here. There's much more to this place than the weird atmosphere. Some creature was watching, the old crab could tell, by the cold, creepy feeling that ran through his shell. Crouching flat in the sand, he peered into the dark. He suddenly saw it. A monstrous blue shark! As the shark wheeled around for a head-on attack, Kermit spied an old chest that was open a crack. He got there a second before the shark did, and in a wild scramble, squeezed under the lid. There's a sword right there. If he had hands, he could use the sword on the shark. Pushing hard with his snout, the big fish tried his best to force up the lid of the heavy old chest. He lunged with a fury and all the brute strength of his broad fins and tail and his twenty-foot length. That's a big shark. But the lid's double hinges were solid with rust and a century's thickness of barnacle crust. 
So the crab stayed within while the shark stayed without. All he got for his pains was a badly bruised snout. And he finally turned tail, then away he went tearing in search of a school of sardines or some herring. Not until he was sure the big shark was long gone did Kermit look down to see what he sat on. The old chest was filled pretty near to the top with a heap of gold pieces that made his eyes pop. How strange, Kermit muttered. No one's found it before. It can't be much more than two miles from the shore. But anyway, all this gold treasure's mine now. If I just haul it back to my castle somehow. With a coin in each claw, he set out for the bay, with his life in great danger each step of the way. Not only the shark, other big fish as well can easily bite through a crab's crusty shell. To avoid being caught by these crab-hungry enemies, he scuttled behind the dense clumps of anemones. See, these are sea anemones. They're like, they look like a flower, but they're an animal, and they have a mouth in the middle. They're a really neat kind of animal. They don't have any eyes or ears, but they grow on the bottom of the ocean. Where I grew up in Washington, you can go find these by the, by the ocean uh, when the tide goes out. Sometimes you can see them, or you can see them in the deep water. They're really pretty, but he's hiding under them so that he's safe. Here the deep shadows were mostly blue-green, so a bluish-green crab there could scarcely be seen. Every day for three months, Kermit made the round trip, returning each time with two coins in his grip. Two at a time the whole time? Wow! To make room for the treasure, he emptied his cave of the rubble he'd gone to such trouble to save. That fish has a big mouth. I'd be afraid of being eaten by him. After stacking the gold into one gleaming pile, his crusty face cracked in a satisfied smile. He was thinking of all the great pleasure and fun such a treasure would bring to a certain someone. Then he crawled from his cave for a view of the bay in hopes that he'd find his young friend there that day. Since the dock was deserted, he looked toward the shore where he spied some small boys, half a dozen or more. I mean six boys, because a dozen is 12. So there were one, two, three, four, five, six. There's, yep, seven. That's about half a dozen, if you're not counting too carefully. Tall ones and scrawny ones. One who was fat, but not one of them wore a striped shirt or straw hat. But his young friend might wear something else altogether since the winter had come with its cold, foggy weather. But anyway, Kermit thought, what could I do? Just walk up and say, here's a present for you? Then he heaved such a deep and most sorrowful sigh he attracted a pelican roosting nearby. Now cheer up, old fellow, the big bird began, smiling as only a pelican can. If you've got a problem, please let me suggest you tell it to me. Get the thing off your chest. No one could resist such a friendly big smile, so the crab told his tale to him after a while, showed all the gold when he came to the end, then tried to describe his heroic young friend. That boy, said the bird, is familiar to me. Some people watch birds. I watch people, you see. The lad has two sisters and also one brother, and then I'm quite certain a father and mother. They live in a very small three-room red shack in the south part of town beside the train track. I could carry the treasure there inside my beak, but I'd swallow it all for my beak has a leak. So if you would like, I'll just give you a lift. Besides, you're the one to deliver the gift. Can you trust this pelican? Maybe, look. And so with two gold pieces tight in his grip, Kermit took off on his first flying trip. <laughs> Across the broad bay in one breathtaking swoop, away through the dense fog as thick as pea soup. By the time Kermit got up the nerve to look down, the big bird was soaring out over the town. Below was a small cottage, painted barn red, beside the train track, as the pelican said. That poor people lived there was easy to see, for it was the one house without a TV. See, they had TV antennas back then, and it feels weird to say back then. When I was a kid, we had TV antennas, and now people don't, because it's all broadcast through a digital signal, but they don't have a TV at all. See? As the pelican came to a fluttering stop, alongside the chimney he let the coins drop. They fell to the bottom, the two friends could tell, for the pot-bellied stove went kerbong like a bell. Then inside the house great excitement broke out. Why it's gold, it's real gold, they heard somebody shout. 
The family ran out to find what it could be, but discovered the fog had rolled in from the sea. A ghostly white curtain closed in everywhere, so they never caught sight of whoever was there. The high-flying crab in the pelican's beak brought the family a fortune inside of a week. Soon they had a TV set and all sorts of toys, such as dolls for the daughters and bikes for the boys. All the rest of the gold, which was quite an amount, they set safely aside in a savings account. For the wise father said, It is not every day that a fortune is dropped down our chimney that way. See, there's the papa and the mama. See how the house looks like it might have two eyes and a nose? I think Bill Pete's drawings are always fun. Okay, monkeys, I'm off. Now remember, whatever you do, do not go down to the mango tree. There are tigers down there, and tigers love to eat monkeys. So do not go down there, do you hear me? Stay up here, where you're safe, where you don't get chomp chomped by a tiger. It's a pity we can't go down to the mango tree. Yeah, I love mangoes. That is a pity. Hmm, maybe, maybe we could just look at the mangoes. That'd be okay, right? Any tigers here? No. no. Any tigers there? No. no. No tigers anywhere. It's uh, safe. Down, 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 down. To the trees below. And look! <gasps> so many mangoes. Oh, there's one within reach just over there. <gasps> what is that? Down below, it's a tiger. Hmm, maybe. Maybe we could just get that little one. We, we keep a close lookout. That'd be okay, right? Any tigers here? No. no. Any tigers there? No, no tigers anywhere. It's safe. Quick as a flash, down, grab the mango, and climb back up. Mmm, mango! So sweet, so juicy. I wish we had another one, though. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Maybe we could just go down there anyway. If there were tigers around, we'd have seen them by now, right? Down, 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 down. all the way to <laughs> the ground. No tigers here. No tigers there. No tigers anywhere. Except behind there, there, and there. Those appear to be tigers. And look, all the mangoes! Mmm, so tasty! So delicious! <gasps> Wait, did I hear something? Tigers! Oh, run! Quick, quick, quick! They're right behind us! Jump! Quick, quick, quick! They're catching up! Climb! Quick, quick, quick! They're going to get us! Oh, it's lucky you're all the way up here. Did you see? There are tigers everywhere down there. Yes, it is lucky. It is lucky, isn't it? Well, we'll have to stay up here now. We can't go anywhere. Not even to the bananas. But th there are bananas? I love bananas. Um, uh, maybe. Nanette!
Today is a day Nanette won't soon forget. Today in the kitchenette, Mom tells Nanette that Nanette gets to get the baguette. <gasps> so excited. Look, there's Grandpa Frog. Baguettes are warm. Baguettes smell wonderful. Getting to get the baguette is Nanette's biggest responsibility yet. Is Nanette set to get the baguette? You need to have money. And you need to cut some cheese from the cheese plate. Frogs don't eat cheese. I guess these frogs do. You bet! There's her coin to go and buy a baguette. She is on her way. But on the way, Nanette sees Georgette and Suzette and Brett with his clarinet. Brett is a tadpole, so he has a tail. Look! There's Mr. Barnett with his pet Antoinette. His pet fly. Don't frogs eat flies? Nanette pets Antoinette. Did Nanette forget the baguette? <gasps> oh no! Got a jet! I've got a baguette to get, says Nanette to the quartet. That's four people. One, two, three, four. And Antoinette, who is a pet, so she does not count. Baker Juliet has met Nanette. She knows it is Nanette's first baguette get. So Juliet gets Nanette the best baguette yet. <gasps> Nanette, did you get the baguette? Mmm, it smells so good. You bet. The baguette is warm. The baguette smells wonderful. <sighs> and there sure is a lot of it. Uh-oh, what's she going to do? <coughs> Crack. The baguette is warm. She has bitten off a chew. The baguette tastes wonderful. <laughs> and there still is a lot of it. Maybe she should have some more. <laughs> Crack! The baguette is still warm. The baguette still tastes wonderful. And there still is some of it. Can Nanette stop tasting the baguette? No, not yet! <laughs> crack, 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 crack! Oh no, oh no, she is chomping and chomping the baguette. Even the crumbs are gone. Mmm, baguette! Oh no! <laughs> there is no more baguette! Nanette begins to fret! Will mom be upset? Will mom regret she let Nanette get the baguette? Kaboom! A storm has set. Now Nanette is wet. Uh, wet with no baguette. Oh. This is as bad as it can get. Nanette wishes Mom had never let Nanette get that baguette. Maybe Nanette will move to Tibet. Tibet would be a far, far away journey. Tibet is as far away as you can get. Nanette would need a jet. Can Nanette go home instead? Can Nanette face her mom? What will she do? <gasps> Where is the baguette, Nanette? Asks mom. Did you forget? There's Nanette's mom and daddy on their wedding day. Her daddy really looks like a frog. Her mommy is a little more cartoony then. And there's a pigeon rides the bus. Walking stick. Hey, can I drive the bus? Please. Or be careful. Nanette did not forget. Nanette is upset. <laughs> Nanette.
heart is beset with regret. She sweats. I hate the baguette! <laughs> she is so sad. Oh, sweetie. Mom hugs Nanette. It is warm. It is wonderful. Like a million baguettes. The day's not over yet, Nanette, says Mom. Let's reset. Yes, let's! Baker Juliet is surprised to see Nanette, but not too surprised. Nanette's mom gets another baguette. Now they are all set. Mom, Nanette, and a baguette. The baguette is warm. The baguette smells wonderful. Mm. Crack! Mom! Today is a day Nanette won't soon forget. Three little javelinas. <clears throat> Once upon a time, way out in the desert, there were three little javelinas. Javelinas? Javelinas are wild, hairy, southwestern cousins of pigs. Their heads were hairy, their backs were hairy, and their bony legs, all the way down to their hard little hooves, were very hairy. But their snouts were soft and pink. One day, the three little javelinas trotted away to seek their fortunes. In this hot, dry land, the sky was almost always deep blue. Steep, purple mountains looked down on the desert where the cactuses, no, where the cactus forests grew. Soon the little javelinas came to a spot where the path divided and each one went a different way. Should they have stuck together? Dun da! We'll find out. Uh, the first little javelina wandered lazily along. He didn't see a dust storm whirling across the desert until it caught him. There he goes! Get out of there, Jackrabbit! You too! Run! The whirlwind blew away and left the first little javelina sitting in a heap of tumbleweeds, brushing himself off. He said, I'll build a house with him! And in no time at all, he did. Along came a coyote. Coyote. He ran through the desert so quickly and so quietly that he was almost invisible. In fact, this was only one of Coyote's many magical tricks. He laughed when he saw the tumbleweed house and smelled the javelina inside. Mmm, a tender, juicy piggy, he thought. Coyote was tired of eating mice and rabbits. Whoa, hey, he turned into a non-real cut. He's a cut. He's wearing a... Hold up. He's wearing a bandana there, too, I guess. But that looks like a real picture of a coyote. And this looks like a cartoony coyote. Which one's your favorite, the cartoon or the real? He called out sweetly, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, shouted the first javelina, who had a lot of hair on his chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll buff, and I'll blow your house in, said Coyote. And he huffed, and he puffed. Do it with me. And he The tumbleweed house away! But in all the hullabaloo, the first little javelina escaped and went looking for his brother and sister. Coyote, who was very sneaky, tiptoed along behind. The second little javelina walked for miles among giant cactus plants called saguros. Um, saguros, they held their ripe red fruit high in the sky, but they made almost no shade and the little javelina grew hot. Then he came upon a Native American woman who was gathering sticks from inside a dried up cactus. She planned to use these long sticks called Sawaro ribs to knock down the sweet cactus fruit. The second little javelina said, please, may I have some sticks to build a house? Ha'u, or ha'u. When he was finished building his house, he lay down in the shade. Then his brother arrived, panting from the heat. 
and the second little javelina moved over and made a place for him. I see a problem with your little uh, your little hut there. Besides that you can let mice in through that giant door. You have no door on the door. The door is just a hole. They're running away. I'll read it. Pretty soon, Coyote found the Saguaro Rib House. He used his magic to make his voice sound just like another javelina's. A little pig, a little pig, let me come in, he called. But the little javelinas were suspicious. The second one cried, No, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Bah, thought Coyote. I'm not going to eat your hair. Then Coyote smiled, showing all his sharp teeth. I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed. Do it with me. And he puffed. And all the swore ribs came tumbling down. And they took off. But the two little javelinas escaped in the desert, still not discouraged. Coyote followed. Sometimes his magic did fail. But then he usually came up with another trick. The third little javelina trotted through beautiful Palo Verde trees with green trunks and yellow flowers. She saw a snake gliding by, smooth as oil. A hawk floated round and round above her in the air. Then she came to a place where a man was making adobe. You can see the bricks lay on the ground, baking in the hot sun. The third little javelina thought for a moment and said, May I please have a few adobes to build a house? Si, sí, answered the man, which means yes in Espanol, in Spanish. The brickmaker's language. The third javelina built herself a solid little adobe house, cool in the summer and warm in the winter. When her brothers found her, she welcomed them in and locked the door behind them. Coyote followed their trail. Little pig, little pig, let me come in, he called. The three little javelinas looked out the window. This time, Coyote pretended to be a very weak, old coyote with no teeth and a sore paw. But they were not fooled. No, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, called back the third little javelina. Then I'll huff. He's not being so old anymore. And I'll puff. And I'll blow your house in, said Coyote. He grinned, thinking of the wild pig dinner to come. Just try it, shouted the third little javelina. So Coyote huffed and puffed. But the adobe bricks did not bite. Again, Coyote tried. I'll huff. <coughs> and I'll puff. And I'll... And he blew and blew and blew. And the house did not fall in. The three little javelinas covered their hairy ears, but nothing happened. The javelinas peeked out the window. Hmm, this is where the story's gonna change. Hey, cover your ears, mouse. Cover your ears! There's a loud coyote outside and he's gonna blow in the house! Oh, 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 oh no, oh no, oh, oh, oh! See those mean teeth? He was hiding them. The tip of coyote's raggedy tail whisked right past their noses. He was climbing upon the tin roof. Next, Coyote used his magic to make himself very skinny. The stovepipe, gasped the third little javelina. <gasps> the stovepipe. Quickly, she lighted a fire inside her wood stove. What a feast it will be, Coyote said to himself. He squeezed in the stovepipe. I think I'll eat them with red hot chili sauce. Whoosh. Sizzle. Oh. Hey, the Mona Lisa. That's a famous painting to have on your wall. Then the three little javelinas heard an amazing noise. It was not a bark. It was not a cackle. It was not a howl. It was not a scream. 
It was all of those sounds together. Yip, yip, ho, yip, yeah, yeah. Away ran a puff of smoke shaped like a coyote. <laughs> The three little Havelinas lived happily ever after in the adobe house. And if you ever hear Coyote's voice way out in the desert at night, well, you know what he's remembering. All the suspicious looking houses in all the deserted woods in all the world, he had to roll up to hers. But there's Foxy. She lives in this big house. See, it's snowy. Those are snowflakes. This little egg would like to come inside because it's cold out here in the forest. It says Beak House because she loves a chickens. See these chickens? They're going to come into play later. Foxy Dubois was utterly charming and always kind to strangers. So she invited Egg in for a bite to eat. Notice the art on the wall. <gasps> that is an egg and a fork. And that it is an egg that has been broken open on top. And that is an egg sitting on a table. And that is a chicken in a birdcage. And that is Foxy with a big spoon ready to eat an egg. And there's an angry chicken. You're going to eat my egg. Don't do that. Foxy, she looks nice, but she may not just want to play with the egg. While Foxy skipped off to the kitchen, egg rocked and rolled around the grand house. You have some interesting paintings, shouted egg. But Foxy wasn't listening. She was too busy cooking up a perfectly cunning plan. How to cook eggs. Eggs make a delicious treat for breakfast. Boiled, fried, scrambled. Which would you prefer? <gasps> that pie has a chicken coming out of it. It says chicken pie. And those are different kinds of eggs. And there's egg in the doorway playing around and she has there's egg coming into the kitchen, and there's chicken art. This is like if you had pictures of hamburgers on your wall. Oh, and that is a teapot. See, it's not a chicken. It's, if it was a chicken, she'd have eaten it already. <gasps> egg has on a bow tie, and they're having some cake, and some cupcakes, and some cake, and some ice cream sundaes and some donuts and some cake lasagna and uh, that is a cookie that's had a bite a very small bite taken out of it and she has an umbrella in her drink and this is a golden chicken uh, that holds candles that's the golden chicken's job oh look a fried steaming chicken fricassee hmm Foxy wanted the biggest, most delicious egg to eat, so she put part one of her conniving plan into action. A conniving plan is a, a secret plan to do something terrible. Uh, she would fatten egg up? <gasps> oh no! When dinner was served, it was a very splendid affair. Egg wobbled with excitement. <laughs> He's so happy to have some cookies and cake and snacks and candies. That's going to make him fat. And then he'll be edible. Foxy wanted a big egg, but she also wanted a fit egg. So after dinner, she put part two of her devious plan into action. They played games. Oh, look, she has a net and a spoon. I guess the net is in case he falls out. Have you ever tried to play a spoon race? It's very difficult. You put a spoon under an egg and you cup it like that and you have to run. Oh, little flower. Uh, you have to run and not spill the egg. So they have a net to catch the egg. And there's hide and seek, I guess. And the egg is hiding very well. And they're playing musical chairs. There are two chairs though, so who's left without a chair? That's not how you play musical chairs. 
They had an egg and spoon race in the hallway and played hide and seek in the library, followed by musical chairs in the drawing room. I wish I had a drawing room. It'd be fun to draw in the drawing room. I don't know what you do in a drawing room. They used to have them. Probably not anymore. At the end of the night, Egg was in a complete spin. It had been a delightful evening, but he needed to rest his weary shell. He's playing the piano while she sings songs about, I don't know, what would she sing about? Hey, there's a spider up there. She should clean that, that's dirty. You simply must stay over, said Foxy. I have something even more wonderful planned for breakfast. Egg is hopping up the stairs with his nightcap, and she has on her chick, chick slippers, and she has a bottle of water and a candle, and she has her hair in a curler, her one hair in a curler. Um, as Egg snuggled down in his cozy bed, Foxy spent the night dreaming eggy dreams. Look, there's a chicken up there with a fork and a spoon. The whole bed is about eating chickens. This little chicken better... There's forks and spoons on the blanket! <gasps> and there she is with her stuffed chicken with a bite out of it. She probably bit it in her sleep, thinking it was a chicken to eat. Dreaming eggy dreams. There were scrambled eggs and fried eggs, poached eggs and baked eggs, and best of all, soft boiled eggs and toast. But when Foxy Dubois awoke the next morning, she was in for a shock. She's dreaming of dancy chickens. Those are the dancing chickens from before. And she's swimming in egg yolk. This is a big egg. Look at that big egg broken off the top. And she's jumping in and swimming in the yolk. Yuck, that would be sticky. During the night, something had changed. Egg was a fragile little thing no more. He was enormous. Foxy rubbed her hands with glee. Her crafty plan had worked. It was going to be a big breakfast. She was so happy. Mmm. Rattle, rattle, crack, crack, crick, crack. But just then, Egg started to crack. Foxy licked her lips. Crack! She licked her lips some more. Then, with one final crack, Foxy saw what was inside. Look, the bed is being crushed. <gasps> crack! <gasps> Good morning, said Alfonso wickedly. <laughs> Am I in time for breakfast? <laughs> he has a mustache. Yee! <laughs> she better run. <gasps> the end. She's moving out of the house. Now, Beak House will be Alfonso the Crocodiles, and he will invite foxes in. That's hilarious. Well, there's the chickens, and look, their eggs can grow up now, and they can have chicks, and the fox does not eat them. What a wonderful story! That is Foxy and egg. One day, a hungry fox was preparing to hunt for his dinner. As he polished his claws, he was startled by a knock at the door. Who could it be? Hey, rabbit! Someone yelled outside. Are you home? Rabbit, thought the fox. If there were any rabbits in here, I'd have eaten them for breakfast. Hmm. See, he's a mighty hunter. He's got his fishing pole there with his net. He's got an umbrella in case it rains. There's him with a fish and a big chicken and a deer. He's a mighty hunter, this fox. <gasps> when the fox opened the door, there stood a delicious-looking piglet. Oh, no! screamed the piglet. Oh, yes! cried the fox. You've come to the right place. He grabbed the piglet and hauled him inside. Oh, no. See him crying. This must be my lucky day, the fox shouted. How often does dinner come knocking on the door? The piglet kicked and squealed. Let me go. Let me go. Sorry, pal, said the fox. This isn't just any dinner. It's a pig roast, my favorite. Now get into this roasting pan. Salt, pepper. It was useless to struggle. All right, sighed the piglet. I will. But 
There is just one thing. What? growled the fox. Well, I am a pig, you know. Uh, I'm filthy. Shouldn't you wash me first? Just a thought, Mr. Fox. Hmm, the fox said to himself. He is filthy. So the fox got busy. He collected twigs. He made a fire. He carried in the water. And finally, he gave the piglet a nice bath. You're a terrific scrubber, said the piglet. Scrub-a-dub-dub. -dub. He's even got a little toy sailboat in his bathtub. There, said the fox. Now you're the cleanest piglet in the county. You stay still now. All right, sighed the piglet. I, I will, but... But what? growled the fox. Well, I am a very small piglet, you know. Uh, shouldn't you fatten me up to get more meat? Just a thought, Mr. Fox. Mmm, the fox said to himself. He is on the small side. So the fox got busy. He picked the tomatoes. He made spaghetti. He baked cookies. And finally, he gave the piglet a nice dinner. You're a terrific cook, said the piglet. See, he's eating the spaghetti. He even has a fruit bowl. There, said the fox. Now you're the fattest piglet in the county. So get into the oven. All right, sighed the piglet. I will, but... What? 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 shouted the fox. Well, I'm a hard-working pig, you know. My meat is awfully tough. Shouldn't you massage me first to make a more tender roast? Just a thought, Mr. Fox. Hmm, the fox said to himself. I do prefer tender meat. <laughs> He's got celery in his mouth and all those trimmings. Time to cook him up. But first... So the fox got busy. He pushed, and he pulled. <sighs> he squeezed and pounded the piglet from head to toe. You give a terrific massage, said the piglet. He's sweating. <laughs> but, the piglet continued, I've been working really hard lately. My back is awfully stiff. Could you push a bit harder, Mr. Fox? A, a little to the right, please? Hmm, yes, yes. Now just a little to the left. The fox does not look like he's having the best time in the world. He's really getting sweaty. Mr. Fox, are, are you there? <laughs> he's falling off the back there. But Mr. Fox was no longer listening. He had passed out, exhausted. He couldn't lift a finger, let alone a roasting pan. Poor Mr. Fox, sighed the piglet. He's had a busy day. Then the cleanest, fattest, and softest piglet in the county picked up the rest of his cookies and headed for home. Fox was so proud of how strong he was. Look, he exercised and he won a race. He was fast and he was strong, but not strong enough. What a bath! What a dinner! What a massage! cried the piglet. This must be my lucky day! Off he goes. When he got home, the piglet relaxed before a warm fire. Let's see, he wondered, looking at his address book. Who shall I visit next? <laughs> There's Fox. He's crossed off log cabin up the hill. There's Wolf next to the tallest pine tree. Coyote he already must have visited. Cave under the hanging rock. I wonder what happened to Coyote. Bear, house with red roof by the river. <gasps> Bear thinks he's got a wonderful dinner surprise this evening. Probably won't turn out the way he thought it would. Oh, well. That's my lucky day. What a story. That's a pretty smart pig.
he goes around fooling all of the predators into giving him dinner and a bath and some snacks to take home and a nice massage. And he's so relaxed, he just goes to bed happy and fat and sassy every night. Well, there we are. Chickens are not the only kind of poultry. Geese and ducks are also poultry. Warning, Foxy Loxy is shrewd, rude, mean, and dangerous. If you see him, call the police immediately. Chicken Little, retold and illustrated by Stephen Kellogg. What is that fox doing? He has a poultry van and he's covering it in sticks and he's hiding it. And then there's chickens and geese all around. Poultry coming, announced Foxy Loxy as he spotted Chicken Little skipping down the road. That little featherhead will make a tasty chicken salad sandwich, he chuckled. But before Chicken Little got close enough for Foxy Loxy to pounce, an acorn fell from an oak tree and hit her on the head. Help! Help! The sky is falling, shrieked the little bird. Her cries were heard by Henny Penny. What's the matter? she asked. The sky is falling, cried Chicken Little. A piece of it hit me on the head. Henny Penny was horrified. Call the police, she cried. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. That hen has a plump pair of drumsticks, observed Foxy Loxy, and they'll be mighty tasty southern fried. He was about to charge forward and capture the two chickens when the clamor reached Ducky Lucky. What's all this cackling about, he demanded. The sky is falling, cried Henny Penny. A piece of it hit Chicken Little on the head. This is terrible, squawked Ducky Lucky, and together the three birds wailed, Help! Police! The sky is falling! Foxy Loxy shivered with greed when he imagined how delicious Ducky Lucky would taste simmered in spices and sauce. Help! Police! The sky is falling! But before he could spring from his hiding place, the cries of the group were heard by Goosey Lucy and Gosling Gilbert. What luck, whispered the fox. I'll toast the bite-sized one as soon as I get home, and I'll pop the fat one into the freezer until Christmas. The sky is falling! Foxy Loxy almost fainted with delight when Turkey Lurkey came running across the fields. There's my Thanksgiving feast, he chuckled. This is the luckiest day of my life. He was about to pounce on his victims when suddenly he realized it was six against one. And that turkey and goose look like pretty tough birds, he murmured. I'll avoid a scuffle by outsmarting these foolish fowl. Poultry, police, police. Disguising his truck and himself, he approached the group and announced, Officer Loxy at your service, folks. What seems to be the problem? The sky is falling, chorused the birds. A piece of it hit me on the head, added Chicken Little. This is an emergency, declared the fox. Into the truck and I'll take you directly to headquarters. They all jumped in the truck. Suddenly, as she looked more closely at the fox, Chicken Little remembered the wanted poster she had seen in town. Wanted, Foxy Loxy for kidnapping poultry. Warning, Foxy Loxy is shrewd, rude, mean, and dangerous. It's Foxy Loxy, she shrieked. Run for your lives! The birds tried to escape, but Foxy Loxy threw Chicken Little into the truck and locked the door. <gasps> Before driving off, the fox couldn't resist reading the recipes he had selected for each of his captives. And as for that nonsense about the sky falling, he sneered, This is what beamed the dim-witted chick. With a triumphant laugh, he hurled the acorn skyward, jumped into the truck, and cried, On to the kitchen! The acorn soared above the treetops and lodged itself in the propeller gears of a Sky Patrol helicopter piloted by Sergeant Hippo Hefty. There's a hippo flying a helicopter in this book. Sky Patrol. Hippo. Hip police. The hippo police. The hippo. Hippolice. Hip police. I can't say that. 
The gears jammed, the propeller stopped turning, and the helicopter plunged down to the earth. The falling helicopter crashed into the cab of the poultry truck. Foxy Loxy leaped from the wreckage, screaming, The sky is falling! The sky is falling! Stop that thug! cried the birds. Sergeant Hefty flattened the fleeing fox. You're under arrest, he announced. You mean I'm under a hippo, snapped Foxy Loxy. During his trial, Foxy Loxy insisted that he was innocent, but the judge sent him to prison on a diet of green bean gruel and weed juice. His honor, the judge, Adolphus Amphibious Frog, spelled P-H. Because an F is not the only letter that makes a F sound. PH also does, like pharmacy. On her way home, Chicken Little recovered the acorn. She planted it next to her coop. Years later, when the acorn had grown into an oak tree, her grandchildren loved to snuggle beside Chicken Little and listen to her adventure. The End The True Story of the Three Little Pigs Everybody knows the story of the three little pigs. Or at least they think they do. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Nobody knows the real story. Because nobody has ever heard my side of the story. I'm the wolf. Alexander T. Wolf. You can call me Al. I don't know how this big bad wolf thing got started, but it's all wrong. Maybe it's because of our diet. Hey, it's not my fault wolves eat cute little animals like bunnies and sheep and pigs. That's just the way we are. If cheeseburgers were cute, folks would probably think you were big and bad too. Look, there's bunny rabbits sticking out in a couple of squirrel legs. And somebody's nose. And there's a rat tail. Would you eat a burger like that? I wouldn't. <laughs> A sneeze plus B sugar equals. But like I was saying, the whole big bad wolf thing is all wrong. The real story is about a sneeze and a cup of sugar. <laughs> this is the real story. There's his ears. Way back in Once Upon a Time, I was making a birthday cake for my dear old granny. I had a terrible sneezing cold. <laughs> I ran out of sugar. There's his granny up there. He's kind of a messy cooker. So I walked down the street to ask my neighbor for a cup of sugar. Now this neighbor was a pig, and he wasn't too bright either. He had built his whole house of straw. Can you believe it? I mean, who in his right mind would build a house of straw? Got to be pretty, uh... I mean, what if, what if the breeze blew a little hard? You know, it's kind of dangerous living in a straw house. Plus candles. What if it's your birthday and you burn your house down on your birthday? That's not a good idea. So, of course, the minute I knocked on the door, it fell right in. I didn't want to just walk into someone else's house, so I called, Little pig, little pig, are you in? No answer. I was just about to go home without the cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. That's when my nose started to itch. I think he's allergic to all this straw. I felt a sneeze coming on. Well, I huffed. And I snuffed. And I sneezed a great sneeze. Oh, there goes the pig. See his bottom flying? And you know what? That whole darn straw house fell down. And right in the middle of the pile of straw was the first little pig. Dead as a doornail. He had been home the whole time. It seemed like a shame to leave a perfectly good ham dinner lying there in the straw. So I ate it up. Think of it as a big cheeseburger just lying there. I was feeling a little better, but I still didn't have my cup of sugar. So I went to the next neighbor's house. This neighbor was the first little pig's brother. He was a little smarter, but not much. He had built his house of sticks. See, here's his house, and here's what's left of the forest. I rang the bell on the sticks, 
on the stick house. Nobody answered. I called, Mr. Pig! Hey, Mr. Pig, are you in? He yelled back, Go away, wolf! You can't come in! I'm shaving the hairs on my chinny chin chin! <laughs> I'm losing my voice, but this is what this guy sounds like. I just grabbed the doorknob when I felt another sneeze coming on. I huffed, uh, uh, and I snuffed, uh, and I tried to cover my mouth, but I sneezed a great sneeze. Uh, <laughs> oh, and you're not going to believe it, but this guy's house fell down just like his brother's. When the dust cleared, there was the second little pig, dead as a doornail. Wolf's honor. See? There's his razor down there in the corner. Hey, sausages. Now, you know food will spoil if you just leave it out in the open, so I did the only thing there was to do. I had dinner again. Think of it as a second helping. I was getting awfully full, but my cold was feeling a little better, and I still didn't have that cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. So, I went to the next house. This guy was the first and second little pig's brother. He must have been the brains of the family. He'd built his house of bricks. I knocked on the brick house. No answer. I called, Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, are you in? And do you know what that rude little porker answered? Get out of here, wolf! Don't bother me again! <laughs> He's the meanest pig in the whole bunch. Talk about impolite. He probably had a whole sack full of sugar, and he wouldn't give me even one little cup for my dear sweet old granny's birthday cake. What a pig! I was just about to go home and maybe make a nice birthday card instead of a cake when I felt my cold coming on again. Oh no. I huffed. And I snuffed. And I sneezed! <laughs> Once again. And then the third little pig yelled, and your old granny can sit on a pin! Oh, that's a nice thing to say. Now, I'm usually a pretty calm fellow, but when somebody talks about my granny like that, I go a little crazy. When the cops drove up, of course, I was trying to break down the pig's door. And the whole time, I was huffing and puffing and sneezing, making a real scene. Look, newspaper reporters. The Daily Pig. Big Bad Wolf. Wolf, I'll huff and I'll puff. <laughs> Red Riding Hood settles dispute out of court. A.T. Wolf, big and bad. Canis Lupus, seen as a menace. That's the Latin name for a uh, wolf, Canis Lupus. The rest, as they say, is history. The news reporters found out about the two pigs I'd had for dinner. They figured a sick guy going to borrow a cup of sugar didn't sound very exciting, so they jazzed up the story with all of that huff and puff and blow your house down. They made me the big bad wolf. That's it. The real story. I was framed. <sighs> but maybe you could loan me a cup of sugar? Pig pen. He's in jail. Poor Wolfie. <laughs> I love watermelon. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Mm -mm, yum. Watermelon good. It's the best. One. That's a ribbon for number one because I like watermelon. Ever since I was a teeny tiny baby crocodile, it's been my favorite. Chomp, slurp, chomp. Ha ha ha. See the rinds? That's a watermelon rind. I like it for breakfast. I like it for lunch. I like a big salty slab for dinner. Ha ha ha. And I love it for dessert. Mmm. I love watermelon. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Gulp. Uh. He's surprised something is wrong. I just swallowed a seed. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I swallowed a seed. It's growing in my guts. See, there's a big watermelon in his x-ray. It's in his tummy and it's growing, oh no. Would that really happen? No, but 
Soon vines will come out of my ears. <laughs> my stomach will stretch. <laughs> my skin will turn pink. Oh! Nobody is afraid of a pink crocodile. I don't want to be in a fruit salad. <laughs> Get it? Because he's green on the outside. He's afraid he'll turn pink like a watermelon. Pink on the outside and be in a fruit salad and someone will chomp him all up. Somebody please help me. <laughs> he's crying crocodile tears. That's a metaphor in uh, a lot of stories. Crocodiles don't have a little tear. They don't really mean it, but this one sure does. Crumble, grumble, goes the crocodile tummy. Oh no, I can't feel it. it. I can feel it growing inside me. It's happening right now. My stomach feels funny. Blip. And out comes the seed. Oh, you gotta cross your eyes for that. Remember how to cross your eyes? Finger out, look at your finger, pull it in. <laughs> oh, here's the seed. That was too close. Whew. No more melon for me. Never again. He won't eat watermelon, that's too dangerous. Well, maybe just a teeny tiny bite. Chomp, chomp, chomp. <laughs> oh, oh, his tummy it hurts again. The watermelon. That is. The Watermelon Seed by Greg Pizzoli. Nom 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 nom! <laughs> <laughs>